Hi, I'm David Freck, lead pastor of Church of the Harvest, and thanks for joining us for our rebroadcast of the sermon that we preached this past week. No matter what part of the week you're in, whether it's the morning, midweek, or in the evening, we're just glad you're wanting to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And we believe the Word of God helps you do that. We're committed to it. We believe it'll change your life. We believe you'll be inspired, you'll be encouraged, you'll be challenged, and we want you to respond. So would you do that when you listen to this message? If you feel God speaking something into your heart or if there's something we can pray with you about, there's many ways you can do that. You can see that in the description below. We encourage you to do that. God bless you. Thanks for joining us and have an amazing experience as you listen to the Word of God. You ready? We're going to get into it. We've been shaping up all summer long. And this has probably been one of my favorite summer series. And, and essentially, here's what Shape Up is all about. It's about learning and applying principles of healing and wholeness for every area of life. It's, it's learning and applying right principles, not just of survival, right? Not survival, but health and wholeness in every area of our life. And here's why I'm dressed like Biff Tannen today. Okay, if you, some of y'all are too young, you don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm dressed this way, um, not because I joined the Russian Mafia, but because I like to be comfortable, I like to dress comfortable before I do potentially uncomfortable things. And for some of us, today is going to be a breeze. And for others of us, it's going to be difficult because we're talking about shaping up our family fitness. All right? And I'm going to take you through a little bit of a training session. Some of y'all sweating already, though, because you got family issues. And that's okay. That's okay. God meets you where you are. And uh, so, so we're going to do this. How, how are we going to do it? Okay? We're going to look at five different things. Okay? I got, I got my little props over here. I made Kevin. You guys give it up for Kevin Curtis. Where is Kevin? <laughs> He's the unsung hero of this whole thing. Without him and Jenny Stump, this whole thing just falls apart. Okay, we got, we got five different areas that we're going to look at. First one, goals. Every good training session starts with goals. If you don't, if you, whatever you're doing, if you don't have goals, you're just doing stuff. Okay, so there's that. That's free, not even in the notes. All right, then we're going to move from that and we're going to do a warm-up. I didn't bring a jump rope because I only have so much room for activities up here anyway. Um, but we're going to take you through a warm-up. Okay, and then we're going to do some strength training, okay? Now, this is just a 15-pound dumbbell, but I can make you cry with this 15-pound dumbbell. You want to know? I'll just punch you in the face with it. No, play it. <laughs> so we're take you through a warm-up, and then we're going to stretch. How many of you know I don't know how to use this thing because I don't actually stretch? No, I do. I stretch, but you need something static. To... So we're going to take you through a stretch, and then we're going to learn about rest. Okay, you ready? You ready? All right, some of y'all aren't ready. Look at your neighbor and say, get ready. I hope you got your coffee. Okay, goals. What are our goals? Goal number one, to know that God creates, empowers, and ordains family. Here's another way of saying that. God designed family. And anything that is designed has a way that it is supposed to function and it has a purpose. So that means that no matter where you are within your family, whether you're a son or a daughter or an aunt or a nephew or an uncle or a mom or a dad or a grandpa, God has designed that role within the family for a purpose. Okay? Goal number two. Goal number two, that we'd be strengthened in our personal relationship with God. No family is greater than its individual members' personal relationship with God. Last goal, that we would passionately and accurately reflect God with our lives and to those who do life closest to us, our families. How many of us realize that it's only getting more and more important that our families are strengthened in the current reality of our culture? This, this is of vital importance, and so I want to I play this out, and I'm going to start, like I said, it will start you off with a warm-up, okay? We're going to get you just, this is a quick warm-up, okay? This is the easy part. You ready? You ready? Here it is. You're doing really amazing. Church, I, I've been here for 11 years, and I want to encourage you. I, I have a unique perspective on the families of our church and whenever I, it comes to how God is represented clearly in his people, you are doing an amazing 
job. You, you really are. And it's something that is, it's so difficult to do. This isn't an easy thing. Parenting and family in 2022 and post-pandemics and in social anxieties and what do we do with God and there's a million opinions on the table and you're staying faithful to the way that you were raised. You're staying faithful to the way that God has shown you and I want you to be encouraged. Can I give you an example of how this is playing out? So this past year, if you didn't know, I was the youth pastor here at Church of the Harvest. I'm no longer the youth pastor. I'm now the family ministries pastor because Pastor David's favorite slogan is the reward for good work is more work. Yeah. So, so uh, I took over the family ministries, and at the time, we had five people running nursery, preschool, elementary, preteen, middle school, and high school. Five people. Okay, so, so I came in with five. I counted uh, two weeks ago, and we have had over 100 people who have come in and in some way, shape, or form said, we are going to help, we are going to give you our yes in family ministries, in seeing the next generation know Jesus. That, look, hey, what I just said was 5,000% growth in seven months, and I don't know if I know what a move of God is if it's not that. And, and, and so when we, when we say, hey, come along, we're not asking you to check a box or to fill a spot. We're asking you to be a part of a move of God. There is a revival, and it is coming, and it is here. I know we sang about it, but we're living in it because of moms and dads who have stood up and said yes to Jesus and representing the gospel in their homes, and you're, you're doing amazing. Okay, now that was the easy part, because I needed to get you ready for the hard part. Okay, strength training. How many of you have actually done strength training before? I used to be a personal trainer. It's one of my favorite things. How many of you, it lasted for more than three weeks? Okay, all right, I'm just checking, just checking the tone of faithfulness. No, because, you know, when, when it comes to strength training, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. Right? You, you, can do, you can do HIIT training, right? which is high intensity intervals. This is 15 pounds. It kind of feels ridiculous because you know, it's not very heavy at all. But, but you can do high intensity interval. You can do uh, CrossFit. You can do, uh, you can do a lot of different things. Cardio is not training. That's just death. Slow death. Okay? That's all that, that is. My body is a testimony to that reality. Um, no, but so the, my favorite and arguably the most effective way to do strength training is called time under tension. Time under tension. What do I mean by when I say time under tension? If our families are going to shape up in our family fitness, then we are going to have to be willing that when pressure is met... With patience, it will produce the strength that unlocks new potential. We have to be willing, if we're going to shape up, if we're going to elevate in our family fitness, we're going to have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And how many of you know that you are forced into discomfort? Like, like you can't avoid the pressure, so you might as well let God use the pressure in the middle and meet it with a patience so that it will produce the strength. Like when, you, when you embrace the discomfort in a controlled way, it gives you the strength to, to deal with the discomfort that you can't control. So... As we do our time under tension, it's important that we understand two principles, our sets and our form. Our sets, that there is work to be done and you cannot avoid the work. You can't avoid the work. Now, a lot of people think that they can avoid the work and it just puts you in a more painful situation and guess what happens when you're in the painful situation? You have to work very hard to get out of the painful situation. So, so you can't avoid the work, so doing the sets, now how you do it matters. Because how many of you know you can go to the gym, and you can lift weights, and you can break a sweat, and you can get moving, and it will produce no results. 
Everybody has that friend. Oh, I went to the gym for three weeks and it didn't work. How many of you, and you've all seen gym fail videos. That's maybe one of my favorite things to watch on the internet, gym fail videos. Just people using machines. It's like, it's not meant that to do, no, quit, quit, quit. But how, how many of you know you can do the exact same thing whenever it comes to church? You can sit in church and you can listen to a preacher and, it, it, and then it doesn't work. It's not working. Okay, maybe you're not working in it, but just, you know, a little bit. So we're going to introduce some tension, just a little bit of tension, and I'm going to give you some warm-up sets. I know we did a warm-up, but it's important if we're going to focus on something, we get some warm-up sets, okay? You ready for tension number one? I'm going to read you a quote. Pastor David quoted this loosely three weeks ago, and I got in trouble for it in some weird way. But uh, if you were here for that, that was fun. Uh, so A.W. Tozier says, all the problems of heaven and earth, though they were to confront us together and at once, would be nothing compared to the overwhelming problem of God, that he is what he is like and what we as moral beings must do about him. The man who comes to a right belief about God is relieved of 10,000 temporal problems so here's the tension. Here's the weight. Who is God? Who is God? And you're going to answer this question whether you know it or whether you don't. And you're not going to answer it with your words. Your words will not be sufficient versus your actions whenever it comes to answering the question of who is God. Especially not to a generation who's coming after you. So it's important it's important that we answer this question correctly. Here's why. Because your representation, how you represent God in the earth is equal to your revelation. Did you hear what I just said? Your representation. You need to understand in all of this, God is the standard. Whether you're a parent, whether you're a child, whether you're a brother or an aunt or an uncle, God and how we represent present God. Look, as a father and as a husband and as a pastor, I will stand in front of God and he won't say, did you do better than the other pastor? And he won't say, did you do better than your parents? He'll say, did you clearly represent, represent me in the earth? And my representation can never supersede my revelation. And in the space where I don't have a revelation of God, I will still reflect an image. It will just distort who God actually is. So, who is God? This is an infinite question, but it is an answerable question. And I'll start here. God is good. Amen. Now, God is good. Right. He is good. But how many of you know that's easy to say, and sometimes because of our situations, that's hard to live. Amen. So I get a unique privilege of getting to do life with your children. And answering how they answer this question is unique. Because this is a question that gets asked to me as their pastor a lot. Royce, is God good? Because I don't know what to do with this. And I don't know. So how we represent, how we look, how we recognize and how we reflect God's goodness in our families is of vital importance if we're going to shape up. You ready for the, for the next little bit of tension? Here's the next little bit of tension, okay? It's just a little bit of weight. This is, easy. This is the warm-up set. You're doing great. Congratulations. You're almost halfway through. Almost. Okay? God is good and God is the Father. So as God reveals himself, he reveals himself as good. He reveals himself as father. Now, I'm obviously not going to be able to exhaust all the attributes of, God's. I'm just, of God. I'm just hitting the high notes here. But it's interesting that out of all the principles, out of all the titles, out of all of the things that God could reveal himself as, he chooses father to be the primary way that we relate to him. And not, look, this is important, he's not a father. Father, he is the Father. 
And too often we perceive God through the lens of our earthly father or our earthly authorities when in fact it's exactly the opposite. The authorities are held accountable to the one who is the father to represent him correctly. To rep- and listen, any space that's in the middle where someone ejects from representing God for who he actually is, God will reveal himself in that unique way. He says, your father may not have done this, but I'm the father, and I'm going to fill the gaps. (laughs) Easy lifting. This is easy lifting, right? Here's how uh, Paul says it in Ephesians chapter 3. He says, for this reason I bow my knees before the father. From whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Now, we're going to get into that last part here in a little bit, but I've I've got to move on. Next little bit of set. This is the last warm-up set, and then we're done. Okay, God is good, God is Father, and God is love. God is love. 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, let us love one another For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Did it say anyone who hates? Did it say anyone who tolerates? Did it say anyone who just puts up with? No, it says he who loves knows God, because God is love. Okay, you ready for the heavy lifting? Okay, I gave you some warm-up sets. That was the easy stuff. Now, now it's, it's going to get a little bit harder. For some of you, some of you, you've been in the gym, you've been in the weight room, you've been in your word, you're rocking and rolling, we're good. Okay, here's the first, here's the first tension that I want to introduce to you. You cannot live vicariously through a preacher's relationship with God. If we are going to shape up in our family fitness, you cannot live off of my intimacy. Now, let's, let's understand something. I want to level with you. I want to balance this out for you. Okay, because there is a season in Christianity where I am more reliant on what someone else's personal relationship is like with God. That season is called immaturity. Okay, it's a season, it's not a lifestyle, okay, it's a, it's a moment that we move out of as we embrace through the inspiration of those examples, relationship with God, to form and format our own, and we come into an experiential knowledge of our own. Listen to this, how Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Who should do that? You, all, us, everybody. And here's why this is such a big deal, okay, especially whenever it comes to family situations. You you having a vicarious relationship with God will only get you so far as what is called assumed belief. Does that make sense? I hope that it would inspire you, but I would hope that that inspiration would take you to a place where you say, I can believe that, and then that belief would take you to an experience, which is actualized belief. Here's why that's such a big deal. You cannot transfer assumed faith. You cannot, because you can't, when your kids come to you and they say, what do I do with the social situation, and what about this going on at school, and what about this going on in culture, you can't say, well, Pastor David said... That is not sufficient, and it will not transfer. You, when Abraham and Isaac went up the mountain, why, why did Isaac go up the mountain with his dad? It wasn't because some preacher told Abraham there's going to be a ram in the thicket because God's a provider. No, it was because Abraham had decades and decades and decades of experiencing God's faithfulness so that even when he called him, he could say, you're coming with me, and Isaac would follow after his father in worship. Why? Because he embraced the personal relationship that we had. Okay. Here, you ready for the next rep? Here's the next set. Sorry. You have to choose a God-centered perspective. If we're going to shape up in our families, you, and, and listen, you have to choose that thing. That doesn't happen by accident. Listen to what uh, Paul says in Colossians chapter 3. He says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with God in Christ. Did you hear that? 
He said, elevate your thinking. Now, why am I telling you this? Your children have been home from school for almost two whole months. That's why I'm telling you this, because it's so simple and easy for it to just become the micromanaging business on the surface level of our lives where we're just correcting behaviors and we're introducing discipline because things are getting out of control. But God says, no, whenever it comes to our situations, whenever it comes to our seasons, get a God-centered perspective, get off the ground and see things from the place in which you have been seated. Quit picking on people. You ever been at a job where your boss was just always over your shoulder, nitpicking? We should have done this. Do this better. Get that right. What happens in that situation? You leave. You should leave. You should leave. (laughs) Hey, guess what? Your kids can't leave. And, 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 And what do you represent about God? Whenever that is the, the relational frequency, here's what, you, here's what you reveal about God, that he's nitpicking at your life. Well, you should have figured that out by now. You should have got that done. You should be further along over here. And get, listen, church, that is not how God relates to his children. Okay? I'm going to keep moving. All right. We can no longer, next set, we can no longer entertain expressions that don't belong to God. This is a big one. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Here's what that means. If God does not express that reality, it is no longer authorized for me to express that reality. Can I give you just one example? Just one example. This is a big one. Disappointment. Mm. Let me ask you a question. Can God be sovereign and omniscient, all-knowing, omniscience, all-knowing over all things in all seasons and all times, and be disappointed? I would heavily argue that he cannot be, because he knew what he was getting into before he got into it. Now, everybody goes to the same place when I do this, because they say, well, well, God, God regretted that he made mankind, Genesis 6. No, it said that God was grieved because mankind's acts. Can we stop blaming God for the manipulation and the darkness of the enemy through other people? Like, God doesn't take life. God doesn't allow sickness. These are things that happen because the enemy. Don't blame God for what the enemy's done. And and so, look. So, therefore, if God cannot be disappointed in his children, I am no longer authorized to be disappointed in my children. I can be grieved. I can be grieved because they're acting a way that they're not. That's an absolutely authorized expression. But I have never met anybody who the testimony of their life is, I know God's loving relationship in my life because my dad was disappointed in me. You see how it doesn't work? Why? Because disappointment creates shame. That is the fruit of that. You know what shame creates? The sin that created the shame. It's a cyclical reality. When we understand, look, grief will create conviction, and conviction will create repentance. And you might be in the conviction zone right now. It's okay. It's all right. I'm with you. I'm spot you. I know this is a little bit of the tension, right? But we have to fight for that space to express God clearly. You made it. Congratulations. Great job. Great job. I know this isn't like Orange Theory Fitness or anything. Uh, can I just say something that is gonna, I'm not going to be able to qualify all of it, but I could probably write a book on it. Ultimately, ultimately, it's about love and the identity that it establishes. I want you to go back and watch this later, and I want you to pause it right here, and I want you to contemplate that statement whenever it comes to the reality of how God is revealed through Jesus And what this is all about. It's really about love and the identity. You and I are beloved. That's your name. Okay? So i got to keep moving. Because now it's time to stretch. And some of you are like, well, aren't you supposed to stretch before you work out? No. No, you're not. Your middle school PE teacher was wrong. Okay? (laughs) You're supposed to stretch after you lift. If you're going to do cardio... Go have fun. And we're going to stretch. We're not going to do yoga because yoga's from hell. I don't believe in yoga. 
yoga is of the devil. Okay, and um, if you go to a yoga studio, have fun. Congrats, I'm not going to bust you up. I just know if you try to pretzel me up and them little things and get me to stand on my thumb or something, you got demons finna come out of me. <laughs> so we ain't doing no yoga, but we're going to stretch, okay? We're going to look at three different areas that God wants to stretch us because God loves to stretch us, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. Okay, so the first stretch. Oh, Henry, let me, let me bring you into the context of what will kind of create the stretch for us. Another A.W. Tozer quote, uh, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The history of humankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion, and our spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. So, so each society is made up of people. How we doing? How we doing, church? How's society doing? I, I would suggest, I, now this society I think is doing phenomenal. I, I, that, I covered that in the warm-up. But I think society as a whole, I think it's, it's far more than we have family issues and family problems. It's even far more, even though the abundance of identity issues continue to grow. I think at the core of it, we have a love issue. That's really what it's about because whenever that society, how is that, how does God call us to live in human flourishing? It's when each individual person has a revelation of God's love in their life and they reflect and reciprocate is the word, that love through their life. Okay, so I want to start with um, relearning love. That's where I want to start, with relearning love. I came into a season of my life when I was 26 years old. I had a young marriage. I had a daughter. I was about to have another daughter. And I came to this realization that my wife deserved a husband to love her in a way that I had no idea how to love her. I knew how to endure people, and I knew how to use people. But I didn't know how to love. And before you just start judging me in that season, I need you to check your tank. Amen. Right? Because let's understand something. Love is an infinite journey. God is love and God is infinite, which means that love is never a box that we check. And I had come to a place in my life where I had checked a cultural box, but when I looked at it through God's lens, I saw that it was enduring people and it was using people. And here's the problem. I had this amazing wife who in this amazing family who is absolutely deserving of a love that I didn't know how to give. And so I had to let God confront me in that space. And I just said, hey God, here's my heart. Here's this thing of stone that you thought was valuable enough to pay the pl price of your, your son's blood for. And I don't know how to transform it. You do it for me. And here's what he said. It was this easy because he just talks to me this way because I'm stupid. No, he's, he said, listen, son, monkey see, monkey do. Monkey see, monkey do. He said, I'm going to love you the way that you're supposed to love your wife. The way that you're supposed to love your children, the way that you're supposed to love your church, the way that you're supposed to love my people. Monkey see, monkey do. All right? It's that easy. And, and, then, and then you go on the journey, and listen, it might happen in a moment. I'd love to tell you that I just figured that out the next day, and it wasn't. It was years, years of me growing in love to get to a place where I could say, God, I know you in your love. The next place that God loves to stretch us. Marriage. God loves to stretch us in our marriage. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because just come back next week. Um, but <laughs> there's a little bit of preview for you. Uh, but if, if you're married in this place and this is news to you, yikes. Okay? The Bible is very clear, okay, on how we should do this. Okay, so i got to keep moving. Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up to, for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. 
In Ephesians, a little few verses later, it says, However, to each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Two observations that I want to make real quick. The first one is, this is not suggestion. Paul's not saying it'd be a nice idea if you figured out how to love Christ like the church. No, like like Christ loves the church. No, he's not saying that as a suggestion. He's absolutely saying this is how God designed this to work. And if that means men, if you have to confront yourself to come into a place of, I'm going to smash two words together that's going to blow your mind. Okay, you ready? You ready? you got to let God confront you to get to a place of emotional maturity women should have been louder. Where's y'all say men's at, wives? Come on. This is your moment. <laughs> no, if you have to allow God to confront that in you to get to that space, he's, this is not a suggestion. The second observation is simple. Did you hear how much Paul instructed the husbands? It was like, husbands do this, husbands do that, husbands ought to, you ought to. And then it's like eight different sentences to husbands, and it's like, wives, Respect your, your husbands. <laughs> that should give us a clue. Men, we're dumb. We're hard-headed. We don't get it. Paul had to hammer that thing in. <laughs> he said, get to emotional maturity. Get to love. If you say, well, my dad wasn't really emotionally intact. Okay, well, the dad created emotions. So get to working. Listen. It should be a clue that the shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. Because men don't read long things sometimes. So he gave us the little one to show us the emotion. Okay. All right. So his personal love impacts us. And then that love unfolds through our marriages. First comes love. Then comes marriage. Then comes parenting parenting. And I'm going to meddle a little bit, but I can't stay here. Now, this is my passion, okay? Um, and, and like I said, you guys are doing amazing. But God absolutely wants to stretch us in our parenting. In case we're confused, because our society seems to be confused, the Bible's not confused, Psalm 127, verse 3, children are a gift from God. They are a reward from Him. How you reflect that in your parenting matters to your children. Selah. All right. (laughs) Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses. Who's he talking to? You, us. The church got itself in trouble for years by telling you as parents, send your kids to us because we are the the spiritual experts. Guess what? We're not. We're not. Guess who is? You are. You are. And you might not feel like, oh, Pastor Russell, you might say that, but I'm not really confident in that. And I don't, I'm not real confident in people's abilities anyway. I'm really confident in God's grace. And I'm really confident that in his sovereignty, he designed and fashioned a person that would look at you and see God very clearly in a unique way that only you can represent. Okay, so... A couple of things. Just, I want to be practical because I know I can be philosophical and up in the clouds all the time. If you have younger children, this is going to be helpful. If your children are grown and old, you're going to be like, wow, I wish I would have known that sooner. But I just, here you go. All right. <laughs> you're always parenting a future version of your child. Th- this is the law of reciprocity in relational equity. I know those were hard words, but it's okay. You'll get there. So it's sowing seeds down here. Listen, a child's subconscious, your subconscious is responsible for 95% of the decisions that you make, and that thing is set by the time a child is four years old. Okay, here's what that means. Mom, dad, let them cry. Please let them cry. Please, because you are subconsciously informing their fight, flight, and freeze responses. And a child who experiences controlled amounts of discomfort will have the right 
fight responses. You ever met someone who's just absolutely non-confrontational? If that's you, again, that's conviction. It's not shame. Just go with it. Okay? The, the reality of being non-confrontational and not able to face oneself comes from having a lack of fight responses. This is just from a psychological standpoint that I'm talking to you about. So it's important that we understand when our little ones are little, we're informing who they're going to become. When you're in front of your seven-year-old, you are planting seeds of your 11-year-old's decision. When they're 11, you're sowing the seeds when they're 14. When they're 14, you're informing them being 18. When they're 18, you're informing them being 21. And then the frontal lobe connects and they come alive. <laughs> For men, it might happen a little bit later. Women, it usually happens a lot before. That's why women are smarter than men. So, so no way, men's ladies, come on, seriously. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's the first kind of practical thing. The second practical thing is you name your children. I, look, in Hebrew culture, in Hebrew culture, they would have one week of observing a child before they gave it its name on the eighth day, which was their name day. But why? Because parents, you have been uniquely You've been uniquely positioned to have a prophetic insight over your children's life. They would observe that child and its latent talents and abilities, and through the observation and through cultivating a prophetic lens over that child's life, they would name that child, and you name your children. Here's what that means. The school system doesn't name your child. The sports team doesn't name your child. The social anxiety doesn't name your child. The disruption doesn't name your child. You name your child, and you better make sure that that name is the same name that God has for them. Even when they want to adopt a different name, you remind them of their name. You name your children. Here's how this works very practically at my house, okay? Because I have a Charlotte, okay? I would use Chloe for this example, but Chloe is Mary Poppins. She's perfect in every way and in all things, okay? So, so Charlotte, though, Charlotte, anyone met Charlotte in here? Yeah, you have, whenever she needs to sell something. Um, so here's what you need to know about Charlotte. She is every bit of me emotionally and in every other way. She's Physically, she's her mother's starfish, okay? But whenever it comes to everything else, she's this guy right here. And God, pray for me and pray for her. It took God literally moving heaven and earth to get to me. Okay, so, so here's how that looks. Because when you have a natural-born leader and they're nine, <laughs> it looks a whole lot like a dictator, Look, we could send Charlotte on a special ops, mitten, uh, special ops mission to Russia, and she would fix this whole Ukraine situation in three weeks. She'd start a coup. She'd take over the presidency, introduce a new government. Okay, and what that looks like a lot of times is she gets bossy, and she starts bossing around Jenny and Chloe. She doesn't do it with me because I'll check her so hard. This so, uh, but, but Jenny and Chloe, they don't want to hear her mouth, and I'm like, I have years of hearing my own mouth. What's well, hers? It's fine. So... They don't want to hear her run in her mouth, and so they'll just do stuff. And, I, and so what I have to do is I have to step in, and I have to say, Charlotte, Char, you are kind. You're very considerate. You love other people really, really well. Why are you acting selfish and arrogant? Do, do you see what I'm doing? I'm affirming identity while correcting behavior. Where did I learn that? Monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> monkey see. Son, son, you're powerful. You're a leader. You have a huge heart. Why are you acting in a way that you're not? Okay, I got it. Okay, you made it all the way. You made it all the way. Rest. Rest. I thought about how awkward would it be if I just took a nap? It's like, Pastor Royce talked about rest. What did he say? Nothing. He took a nap. And like, how awkward would it be for you if you're like, what is he? <sighs> no, rest. I hope you're picking up the theme that rest is of vital importance. You, you, you can't shape up if you don't rest. And, and here's what I've 
Guys, we live in a busy culture. The worship team can go ahead and come on out. We live in an insanely busy culture. And here's one of the things that I've learned about busyness. Oftentimes, busyness is the subconscious act of trying to prove conscious value. Because if I'm busy, I'm needed. And if I'm needed, I'm desired. And if I'm desired, I'm fulfilled. And it's killing us. It's literally killing us. And mom, where do you go to find rest when the kids are little and they're screaming and they're going all over the place and you've got 15 million drop points. You're the taxi driver for the kids for their god-awful sports schedules. Look, they're probably not going to get a scholarship on it anyway. Send them to church so that they can find out who they are in Christ. I got it. I'm running out of time. Where do you find rest? And here's what I want to suggest. You find rest at the cross. You find rest at the cross because it's at the cross where all the names and the identities, all the value that we're trying to prove is shown to us exactly for what it is. We, we get to step out of the labor of trying to earn an identity and perspective and opinion of others that's pleasing. And we get to stand in front of the one who gave us a new identity and made us a new creature. And the striving ceases. Spiritually, is the striving ceased? In your relationship with God, has the striving ceased? Or are you still in that place where you're working to get into a room that you're already in? Here's what Romans chapter 3 has to say. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. This gift, this righteousness, what, what does that tell us? I had someone ask me, Pastor Royce, will we be righteous on the day of judgment? Listen, for those of you who are in Christ, you'll never be more righteous than you are right now. You may mature, you should mature. Please, for the love of God, mature in your righteousness, but you have been given the fullness of everything that is Christ's, and it comes the moment you put your trust in him. I don't have anything else. I don't have enough communication skills. I don't have a spiritual resume. I don't have anything other than Christ on that day that gives me confidence that the declaration over my life is, son, enter into your rest. Well done. That is the declaration over your life. It's where we inherit this declaration. It's where this becomes mine. This is my son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. When was the last time you rested in the declaration that you are God's child, that he is madly, deeply in love with you, and he's pleased with you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he's pleased with you? This is what we know by faith. And it, you know, the other thing that we find as we rest at the cross is we find who our real family is. John chapter 19 says, And standing by the cross of Jesus, his mother and the sister of his mother Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary the Magdalene, Jesus therefore seeing his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by said to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. You find your real family. And that may all sound good and fun. But you might be in this place you might say, Pastor Royce, that sounds great for you. And I love this cute little analogy and the thing you did and your little tracksuit and yay. But I'm hurt. I'm hurt and even resting is uncomfortable for me because of the pain that I've experienced. So it's even more cruel that you would ask me to lift the weight and to stretch. Listen, <laughs> 
I don't come to you to this place as someone who doesn't know that brokenness. The first name I knew was Royce. The second name that I knew was Reject. And I know what it's like to have a wound that you can't heal. And here, can I remind you of something just real quick? Maybe you don't know this, but Psalm 147 says that he heals the brokenhearted and that he binds up his wounds, binds up their wounds, I'm sorry. Can I remind you what Psalm 168 says? It says, sing to God, or Psalm 68, I'm sorry, sing to God, sing in praise of his name, extol him who rides on the clouds, rejoice before them, his name is the Lord, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. He sets the lonely in families. I'm going to invite the prayer teams to come back up and you guys can stand. We're going to go into a time of worship and maybe you're in this place and you're like, man, thank you. That was refreshing and encouraging, Pastor Royce. And maybe you're in this place and you're like, I'm hurt. And we're going to have people all up front here that will be able to pray for you. So whether you're in a place of worship or whether you're in a place where you're like, Pastor Royce, I'm I'm wounded. We're, We're going to lean in to the presence of God and his goodness and his faithfulness. And we're gonna see him bring revival to this place because you're gonna do it, church. Because you're strengthened and your family fitness. Love you guys.